Hi guys, welcome back to Infinite Possibilities, the podcast where we explore the lives of amazing people, their choices, challenges, and opportunities. And today, I have a very <laughs> special guest, Mark Griffin. How are you? <laughs> good, good. <laughs> good, nice. So Mark Griffin, he's actually um, one of the lecturers in business analytics, and he also has his own company, <laughs> Insight. So this is going to be really cool to see how he sort of balances both worlds. But for the first 10 people that click this, they want to know how you know Len Coop because <laughs> um, they are both our professors. So yeah, how do you know Len, Mark? Yep, yep. okay, so, so very, very long story. So, the, um, so, I, so I'm a, a workshop presenter, so I uh, present, I've now presented something like 100 two-day workshops and 45-day workshops in statistics across Australia. And one of the organisations that I work for is, the, is AXPE, so the Australian Consortium for Social and Political Research Incorporated. So I've been a workshop presenter there for five years, and Len's one of the vice, I think he, his role is the vice president of, the, of that, of that um, NGO, that non, um, not-for-profit organisation. Yeah, that's cool. And so have you guys known each other for like a solid few years? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. So we probably had weekly meetings for something like four years now. Oh, <laughs> wow, damn, okay. So, um, yeah, do you have a first impression of Len, just for my listeners? Yep, yep. So Len's a very, very nice guy. Simply a nice, easygoing guy who I think is actually well known around the, around the School of Business here at the University of Queensland as just somebody where people can go to, ask questions. Len does his best to make time, really talk to people, help them where they are. Wholeheartedly agree. Len is so nice and he has so much patience. Yep, yep. Yeah, and he's like so gentle and calm. Like, yep. I'm like really agitated. I'm like, I can't figure this out. And then Len is like, calm down, Karen. You know, part one, part two, part three. Yep. So good. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. So we're going to start the beginning and see what kind of childhood Mark had. Right. <laughs> Mark, so, you know, around high school time, how would people describe you? Hmm. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, very, very nerdy, so, oh. so t t the, t the typical stats stereotype. So thick glasses, <laughs> not, not good at sport at all, um, would much prefer to be curled up in, a, in the corner of the library with, with my maths textbook. Um, yeah, and girls, no <laughs> idea what girls are, still don't quite know, but yeah. <laughs> good response. <laughs> Wait, so how did you, so um, was your like, I guess, love for statistics, like, was that something early on? Like, no, definitely not. Wait, and how, how, did, <laughs> how did it develop? So maybe I think we have to go back to primary school. Do you remember anything from primary school? <laughs> so primary school, I mean, so in the sense of that primary school, to put this in perspective, when I first started my primary school, I mean, even though I was a school here in Brisbane, it was actually a tiny school, so it was one teacher school for teaching all seven years, all seven grades, and we had something like 20 kids at the school. Um, I was, you know, for some bizarre reason, actually topped all of my subjects, but mathematics was the subject that I sort of topped the, on it, topped the most. Oh. And that sort of continued on to the high school. I mean, sort of, found as I moved into a much larger high school, sort of found all the other subjects really challenging, but mathematics, yep, just instantly got mathematics. And, this, and one of the things that happened in the high school was got skills testing done by a psychologist. And afterwards, the psychologist said to me, Mark, when it comes to absolutely, every, sorry, when it comes to mathematics, you're an absolute genius. When it comes to absolutely everything else, absolutely average. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you didn't say below average, right? Oh, damn, that's crazy. <laughs> wow. So I guess, like, so when you were in high school, did it become like, like immediately obvious that you're going to do stats? No, 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 definitely not, definitely not. Oh, really? Because you topped it. Like, <laughs> your parents would be like, Mark, you know, do, do stick with your strengths. <laughs> I mean, so, so I'd also say that one of my major influences in high school was my grandfather, so my mum's father. Oh. So he was a radio transmitter designer. So like I'm AM, AM and FM radio. So he designed and installed all of the early radio transmitters that went in around Australia. And indeed, his, sort of, his designs that in, in, at, at the time, they were the best signal-to-noise quality, so the best quality oh. of any transmitter designs anywhere in the, in the world. So he designed transmitters that went, on, went in everywhere. So I, at that stage, my parents and I and my sister were living here in Brisbane. My grand, uh, grandparents were both down in Sydney. 
well, on both sides we've done in Sydney. So I spent my sort of summer holidays working with him in his lab, and he'd be designing all these massive radio transmitters, and he would sort of say to me, Mark, your summer project is to create something like a little flashing light. And so somewhere that these days, if that transmitter is still in operation, there'll be this amazing transmitter, and somewhere there'll be my little electronic circuit in that sort of, um, in that transmitter. So I sort of had that experience over high school, and I sort of felt mathematics is where I'm good at, but I don't want to just be on it, do mathematics, numbers and equations, that stereotype of, well, it's numbers and equations, but it's not relevant to everyday life. And typically there's a stereotype of what you tell a student who's like that. You tell a student, go study engineering, and that was my, what my grandfather did, and he was also encouraging me to do engineering, so that's what I did. But then over time, I mean, it was the thing of all the engineering subjects, which were not mathematical, they were more theory based, then really struggled with them, only got like a five. Um, those subjects that were mathematics, I don't know, no work whatsoever, I got a seven in all of them. But it was all, this, all, all the way, um, this thing of, again, the stereotype, stats, I don't know, stats, theoretical, dry, boring, why would anybody want to do stats? Yeah. All I ever saw of stats was that stereotype. And there was probably during my PhD, so I did my PhD in mathematics, uh, but not in stats. And at some point during my PhD, I'll come across this quote by, and I'm tempted to say, and I'm going to get this wrong, and I uh, apologize for the recording, so cut this out of the recording. <laughs> so Wallace, I think, has in the Kruska Wallace method, and he said that statistics may be defined as a body of methods for making wise decisions in the face of uncertainty. So statistics may be defined as a body of methods for making wise decisions in the face of uncertainty. I love that quote because there's nothing about equations, it says nothing about numbers. It says, talks about understanding the world, and that's who doesn't want to understand the world in a better way. And I came across that definition of stats, and I thought, yes, I want to understand the world in a better way. If the mathematics allows me to do that, I want to do stats. And so I've now done my, so I went back a number of years back, did the graduate diploma in stats, the master in medical statistics, um, was working for, for a couple of years in the pharmaceutical industry over in Switzerland, um, doing uh, analysing data there. Um, I'm, I've been for many years on the executive board of the, sorry, the executive committee of the Statistical Society of Australia. Um, so stats, very much something which I love. Oh, that's crazy, <laughs> like stats all the way. But yeah, I find that everything in life is framing, like how you choose to frame it. Because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but that's really interesting. So I guess that's why you chose engineering, because it had a sort of like almost practical yep, relevance yep. to the real world. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and then so how did you decide to study at UQ? Ooh, wait, good. you wait. What was your your first bachelor was in computer science and? Yep. So I did so I did bachelor of computer engineering, yep. bachelor of science in computer science and mathematics. Oh, so you still think <laughs> mathematics? <laughs> so you're like, okay, I'm going to take grandpa's advice on yep. one hand. I'm also going to take my own advice yep. and merge both worlds. <laughs> ah, that's so cool. And yeah, was UQ an obvious choice for you? Yeah, I mean, so the, so to put this in perspective, um, particularly for those people who are outside Brisbane. There are probably three main universities in Brisbane. There's UQ and QUT, um, University of Queensland, Queensland University of Technology. They have the two, the two highest uh, personas, brand images, and then Griffith University, which has a lower um, brand image. U, uh, QUT is a lot more practical. UQ is a lot more academic. I, being the academic guy, not very good at me, not very good at the practical stuff. I mean, my grandfather said, Mark, I know, do engineering, go to QUT because it's more practical. Whereas I, being more mathematical, more intellectual, not very good with, with my hands and the practical stuff, UQ is the place for me to be. Oh, so you didn't end up following your grandfather's advice. Nice. <laughs> Please don't tell him. Yeah. <laughs> wow, damn. <laughs> but that's kind of cool because I think some people, they like, I guess like their parents, their guidance have a very strong influence, but mm -hmm. he was like, Here's my advice, Mark, and yeah. take it or leave it, and then you sort of forged your own path. Yep, 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 yeah. for sure, for sure. But I also have to ask you, so you were really good at maths, but did you like it? Because I know some people, they're super good at a subject and they hate it. So yep. what, was, what was it? Did you, did you like maths or were you just like, I'm just good at it? <laughs> um, I loved it probably, <clears throat> yes, again, to show, you how much, how, to show you how much of a nerd I am, it's probably the best story, well, for me, one of the best stories. So... Again, I sort of said that I lived, that my, fam my media family was here in Brisbane. My grandparents were down in Sydney. So my parents 
went away in the middle of the year, so six months into the year, um, and sort of said, okay, we're going away for a, on a fantastic holiday for a month. Uh, my sister and I um, were sent down to our grandparents that, uh, for a month. So I started school there six months behind everybody else um, in that particular year. Uh, sorry, so I started in the sense of, at the start of the year, the students were told in the maths class, here's a maths textbook, work through the exercise at your own pace. Six months later, I was there for a month. But I, I know, being the, again, being the maths nerd, I couldn't think of any better thing to do on a Monday, on a weekday afternoon, than to go home, and work through the puzzles, uh, work through the puzzles, the, the games, the exercise in my maths textbook, and sort of spent the entire afternoon, every afternoon for the month, working through the maths textbook. And at the end of that, which I know, so it didn't get very, wasn't very popular with the kids, the other kids in my class, because the teacher found out about this and actually found out Mark started the maths textbook six months after you. He's now ahead of where you are in the maths textbook because he spends every afternoon doing this. Any of you who have fall behind where Mark is, you're going to be on detention until he catches up with where Mark is on the textbook. <gasps> I would <laughs> so hate that, that teacher. <laughs> Oh, so, I had, so I had all these kids back to me, Mark, don't do any more mathematics. We don't want to be on attention. <laughs> wow. And I have to know the ending of the story. So did you, or did, did you not do it or did you do it in secret? Or? I did it. I did it. You did it. Oh. And the teacher. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody who's listening from that, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, wow. But that's so cool. And what, what, did you, what did you like about the math? Is it like you fall into a sort of flow state or like, what is it? Like numbers make more sense than words or... Yep, yep, yep. I mean, just, sim just simply patterns. I mean, and it's, even when I was little, I mean, I don't know, I don't know, as, as soon as I could, I don't know, um, probably before I could speak this whole idea of patterns, I know, you, I know you put like a little game in front of a, a little baby, fantastic, they're playing with the game. Me, at that age, anything that involved a puzzle, would love that. Oh, <laughs> damn, damn, that's pretty cool. Wow, very, very smart. <laughs> so, let's go to university. So, you did your computer engineering, yeah. you also did your science. Yeah, yeah. And how, was that like a four-year degree? Five, five, five years. Five-year degree? And how was it, did you have any, I guess, like, um, any juicy stories about your time studying at UQ? Hmm. No, I mean, only, only, only just simply that story that, again, the, all the maths, <laughs> completely topped the maths, all everything which, was, wasn't, which wasn't maths, which actually required practical stuff, really struggled with that. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, did you like, and did you like university a lot more than high school? Because I feel like, um, I personally find that, like, in high school, it's like, you're cool if you're the same, but yeah. university, there's almost like a sort of like um, coolness to being different. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And then I find that like university, there's just so much more autonomy and there's just so much more diversity, you're no longer in that tiny bubble. So how did yeah. you find university compared to high school? Yep. Yeah. So I would say that on, that on a personal level, I actually, I actually was the opposite. I preferred high school much more to university. What? <laughs> so it's in the sense of that, I think probably most schools, it's this idea of what's the big click within the high school. The big click has all the kids who are into sport. Yeah. I wasn't at any stretch of the imagination in that. But the second biggest click is the music students. And I was a music student. Ah. <laughs> so we had a sort of very, really tight knit group of, of music students. So I've been, to put this in perspective, not in the last couple of years, but for the last 30 years, I've been singing, singing in choirs. So probably the largest group that my group, my choir, about 40 voices sung in front of, was about 15,000 people. Um, and the largest group that I personally sung a solo in front of was about 400 people. Um, so I probably sung in hundreds of concerts over that time. We had a high school, we've done both once within high school, once a couple of years out of high school, had a one month choir tour. So in high school, it was one month choir tour over to Europe. And it was one of these things of you, for a month, traveled around, did at least one concert a day for a month, which meant that by the end of the month, you really knew the music. Yeah. So that was really tight knit in high school, that group. And the, just the, so, the social connections, which I had in, in university, weren't anywhere near that tightness. Oh. So high school, fantastic time. Damn, that is so cool. I've like never heard that like being a music student was cool in high school. <laughs> but wow, damn. And I'm like, don't know if you will um, like, what is it? Accept the request, but I'd love to hear a few, a bit of your singing. <laughs> <laughs> Are you comfortable? Later, later. Okay, at the very end, guys, stay tuned. 
Wow, that's so cool because I didn't know that you were also a singer, but it's sort of it's sort of cool because it's sort of I guess breaking the nerd image, if you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you have did you play any instruments by any chance? Oh, just, just a little bit of piano. Yeah. So not it's not a, not a lot, but a little. Yeah. Oh, I played piano when I was younger. <laughs> oh, okay, that's really cool. Damn. So I guess um, yeah, university. Do you have any sort of like I guess tips for people like if they're just starting university, sort of how to like it's a very very big transition from high school mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. university? So I think there's a few things there that I would say. I think that a lot of people get paranoid about their decision of what choice to, to study at university. And I would sort of say that probably no matter what you do, you're going to find that you're going to change careers three or four times over your entire career. I mean, I know that I certainly have. So I started out in oh, some, of the, some of the things which I've done. So my PhD was you know, basically joint between mathematics, computer science and chemistry. I then moved into medical imaging for about 10 years, uh, so basically extracting, using mathematics and computer science to extract features, interesting features from the, the medical images. Then moved into public health, then moved in, so again, I know, populations of I know, tens of thousands of people, um, how do we understand what's happening within those populations. Then I'm now probably within more business analytics than health, but for me when I, and that's one of the challenges I have teaching here, Often the students talking about business analytics are all working in commercial companies. For me, I work in business analytics, but I work predominantly within the NGO sector because the thing which drives me is not the thought of how can I help people make money, it's how can I do things for the social good. So things like you know, human trafficking or um, childhood education, these are things which are passionate for me. But how, how do I manage to find a way to use mathematics to sort of benefit that sort of that field? That's the, thing which, that's the thing which excites me. So all that's to say that you, throughout your career, you're going to sort of change careers a few times. Um, and some of those are not, I mean, mine was all within the maths IT, but some people I know, they start off in medicine, then they're going to law, then they're studying architecture. Yeah. So no matter what you study, you're going to sort of do that. Also, the, the thing which I just can't stress enough, I think it's a mistake, even though I did it myself, um, I think it's a mistake people who spend all their time in the textbooks, the more you can get out, talk to different people within the field about who, what they're doing, what's exciting, what's not exciting, what, um, what do they say about their field, what advice do they have for you. The more that you can talk to different people um, about what's happening in your field, what's happening in different fields, the better off you'll be. So always look for those opportunities. Even if you're volunteering at a place, look out for those, those opportunities, broaden that network. Yeah, that's really good advice. Like being open-minded. A lot of people, they have like, I'm going to do this and that, and then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's very boxed in. But I really like how you said like business analytics is pretty much like a tool. It can help you with like social good. It can help mm -hmm, you with mm -hmm. X, Y, Z. It's not just about helping people make yeah, more yeah. money, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, the, <clears throat> so exactly as you know, I mean, the world, the world that we're living in is, when they, 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 the, the label of data which are knowledge poor, no matter what field you're in, yeah, everybody's exactly. in the process of collecting data. And the idea of can you work out the patterns present within that, within that data, then, I mean, if you're wanting to, what's your objective? If your objective is to make money, if your objective is social good, if your objective is, I don't know, um, to have fun. I'm in the entertainment industry, I want to have fun. Um, what's the best opportunity for doing that? You've got data, teasing out the patterns within that data. Yeah. It means that... One of the things which steered me away from stats, again, is looking at the stereotype. All I knew at the start was a stereotype. Yeah. Was the stereotype. It's not well relevant to real life. It's just numbers and equations. The moment you move past that to realise everybody's, everybody's got data, everybody's trying to make sense of the data, then you realise there's actually no field that's more connected than stats because everybody needs stats. Oh, yeah, that is 100% true, especially in this information age. It's yep. becoming like it's only going to get more exactly. like, popular. Exactly. Oh, damn, that's cool. Yeah, let's go back to that university degree. So yep. um, you did five years and then like were you someone who I guess like sourced internships at the same time as studying or no. like how did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Straightforward uh, answer. No, no. And, and, and I mean, it's one of these things, so, and, and so I sort of say, don't do what I've done. Um, so, so seek out those internships. Um, yes, I wish that I had done more of that in hindsight. Um, I, so I started studying, I mean, and it was one of these bizarre things that, so going into university, I mean, my grandfather, and keep in mind the, the year of that time, the year, so um, my mum was, um, 
So I was born in 1972. You didn't hear that? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not that old. Beep, beep it out. <laughs> but sort of thinking about that my parents were sort of studying, studying at university just before that in an era where women, I don't know, the stereotype at that time or the, the thinking at that time was women, why would a, a woman ever need university education because all a woman's going to do is to get married and have kids. Yeah. She's going to become a housewife. Why would you ever study? And my grandfather, he, he and his wife had um, one boy and three girls. And he said to them, look, I don't, I don't care what you study, but I want all the kids to go on to university. And so mum was one of these, it's something like she was the first, she was one of the first um, female students at the University of Sydney. And one of the first females to be able to use their computer, which at that stage was, here's this building, that's the computer, and the, the punch cards, you need to make your punch cards go over and put those into the computer at the University of, at the, um, at the University of Sydney. Um, so... Yes, so she came from that academic family. So my, both my mother and my sister um, have, both have four, four university degrees. So I've come from a very academic family. Um, and yes, so, um, so study, yeah, so going in, so when I finished high school, it wasn't, it didn't even occur to me that you could do anything else after high school. It sort of was just, I don't know, you go to university, that's just what you do. It just never occurred to me that, that people actually did anything else. So I went to university. Even before I got to university, I knew that I was going to do a PhD. Yeah. I just didn't know what I would do the PhD in. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's so crazy that you thought so far ahead because I'm just like, okay, just get my bachelor's and like, let's just see how I go. I don't think, wow. That's like thinking like a salt, like doing a PhD takes like five years. That's like yep. thinking like a 10 years yep, in yep, advance. Yep, yep. <laughs> Oh, that's so crazy. But yeah, this is like a common theme that I've seen with Mark, like his love for learning. Yeah. And he topped his mother's and sister's four degrees with a solid six degrees. So we would dig into that later. Yeah. And then so straight after, um, straight after you did your bachelor's, you went yeah. straight into honours? Um, so so honours honors was included in, the, in that five years. Oh, okay. So I did, so did the five years, then went straight into the PhD. Oh, and I have to ask you, like, I have a bunch of friends writing their honours thesis right now. Yeah. What was the honours journey like for you? I mean, so honours, I mean, because it was part of the degree, mm. it wasn't as though it was like a separate thing which I had to think about. Yeah. So I didn't, I mean, study in general was intense. I mean, at the University of Queensland, I think it's, well, well until we had the, these advanced degrees, which is one of the things which you're doing, <laughs> But until then, the, the, the two most challenging degrees at the University of Queensland, and they were competing against each other as to which one was the most challenging, oh. would be engineering and law, engineering and medicine. So medicine, there'd be all the head knowledge, yeah. but engineering, how do you, how do you apply, you know, how, do, how do you apply these techniques? And they would sort of compete against each other as the most challenging subject uh, course at UQ, and probably at most universities. Yeah. Um, so yeah but I mean, the honest year wasn't as, wasn't as separate year as such. So I was just challenging the whole way through. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the PhD that, yeah. So I would sort of say, for anybody who's sort of new to this idea of on it, what is a PhD? Yeah. I think when I first heard about this thing called a PhD, I saw it as, well, a PhD is a sign of intelligence to have some, somebody who have a PhD. These days, I think, yes, you need to be reasonably intelligent, but it's actually more a sign of stamina and determination that you're just going to keep on going to see it through. And I think that anybody who's got a PhD, you know, I, I take my hat off to you. I'm yeah. glad I've got my PhD. There's no way I could ever go back and do another PhD just because <laughs> it's just so demanding. <laughs> oh, damn. And do you believe this is true? Some people say that our PhD is easier than an honours thesis because honours thesis is like one year, cram your whole thesis. Mm -hmm. But PhD, you can um, space it out, they say. But what, yeah. what's your take on that? Hmm. Interesting. The, um, I mean, so they both have the challenges. I mean, exactly as you say, the honours year is a very intense year. Um, at the same time, while it doesn't, while it may not feel like this at the time, when you're doing an honours project, you're actually really doing your project under somebody else. So you have a little bit of free thought, but it's only when you get into the PhD, you realise how much more free thought you need to develop and you're going to be assessed on whether you've actually been able to do do free thought within that research, what new intellectual contributions you're able to make during your PhD. It's this whole idea that by the time you finish your PhD, that, you, that there's a very, how about Let's go back to step. As an academic, the goal of an academic is to become the number one expert in the world. And that's not because you're, 
Yes, you're intelligent and you're going to do amazing work, but the reason why you've become the number one expert in the world is because you've chosen such a very, very sp specific topic that by definition, you're the expert in the world because you're the only person looking at that specific topic. Uh, so by the time you finish your PhD, you've chosen, you, you've sort of chosen a topic at that point in time. You know the topic, but you so far haven't yet, in most cases, haven't become the, the number one expert because you're only at the start of that research career. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> damn, damn. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so I guess like a lot less, like a lot more freedom yep, yep. to choose your PhD. Yeah. Um, then in your thesis. Yeah. So when you were doing, um, wait, first of all, you said that thesis was incredibly hard. Yeah. Wow, I saw on your LinkedIn, straight after <laughs> thesis, you went straight into PhD. How did that happen? <laughs> what happened to taking a break? Oh, no, no, no break, just keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> wow, incredible. <laughs> wait, so when you, um, so I have like two questions. So like, how did you sort of determine your research interests for your thesis and for your PhD? Was it something that was like, I know some um, supervisors, they sort of, I guess like hand feed you the topic yeah, yeah. or like, how does it, how does it work for you? Okay. <clears throat> so honours thesis largely, for the most part, students get that from the, get that from their supervisor. Yeah. Um, so we had a choice of honour. Here's a list of all the supervisors and all the projects and you chose one. Um, I won't tell you how much of this is actually now within the, the um, within the Bachelor of Advanced Business. What is it? 30, 25 years on. Um, but I actually did my, my honours thesis in, in neural networks. And so some of the concepts which, um, which, which, which I prepared for those courses, you'll actually, I remember it from 25 years ago. What? <laughs> Man, that kind of sucks in the sense that I feel like, wow, we're learning what Mark learned 25 years ago. Way to catch up. <laughs> right, catching up with Mark has been a lifelong struggle. <laughs> oh. Man, but yeah, wait, so when you say you did neural net networks, that was for your honours, right? That was my honours, and then for the PhD. So, to put this in perspective, so I was working on a field called magnetic, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is basically a technique using chemistry. I'm trying to put a sort of chemical field really simple, you're looking at, you're looking at putting molecules within magnetic fields, to see how they respond to the magnetic field to understand the types of bonds between the atoms within those molecules. Oh. Within that, you have a thing called a matrix, which is basically like a, a table of numbers oh. used to describe what's happening within that molecule. We were looking at doing some matrix computations and looking at a new type of mathematics so we could do those, those mathematics calculations much faster. That's in a simple... Oh. Yeah. Damn, I, I, like, I can, like, in that simple, simple explanation, I can already, like, sort of appreciate the complexity <laughs> inside of it. Wow, damn. And so, <laughs> during your PhD, was it like five years, four years? Five years. Five years. Did you ever get sick of it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, wait, when, when, did you get, when did you start to get sick of it? Was it like around, like, the two-year mark out of the five-year or...? I mean, so, I think that there's a very stereotypical evolution of a PhD. I mean, you start the PhD in that first year, it's commonly referred as the honeymoon period. Oh, this whole, so idea, good, this so whole idea that you walk in, here's all these amazing ideas, you've got so much time to do the PhD in, <laughs> and you're going gonna, you're gonna to just revolutionise the world throughout your PhD. And then you get to the end of that first year, well, about a year later, in, you realise actually maybe that's slightly idealistic, uh. and you start to set a lot more on realistic goals. And you're sort of on the second year, probably sort of nailing down and sort of getting on it, doing the work. Yeah. And then probably around the end of that second year, it's starting to really drag on. And you, in a lot of cases, you see all of your friends and they're having these amazing lives and they're making all this money. Oh. And you're thinking, I'm stuck in this lab doing things which I, I don't, I'm starting to lose all my interest in. Yeah. And it starts to wear away at you. And on it, typically, your experiments are not working. So you're trying to do this research and you think, oh, heck, I've got a year to go but things are not working yeah. um, and they just wear away at you. And so by the end of the year, by the time you finish, you sort of think, look, I just, I just want to be out of there. Unfortunately, that's, this, that's a stereotype for many, well, stereotype, that's what happens for most PhD students. Yeah. So again, for any PhD student listening, all I can say is I'd, well, I'd fully take my hat off to you. Well, yeah, if I had, <laughs> had one. <laughs> Yeah, damn, that's crazy. Because I've asked other people, I'm like, what's it like doing a PhD? They're just like, don't do it. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah, I've like only ever heard negative things, but um, I guess it makes sense. Did you have any times where like you were so, so close to quitting or did you always, I guess, see that light at the end of the tunnel? I wouldn't, so, so I must confess that, that, that I wouldn't ever quit. It did actually wear away me. Um, did actually wear away to me at the point where, and it probably the same for a lot of PhD students, yeah. where your mental health sort of starts to suffer a lot yeah. because of the PhD. Yeah. And I know I was the same. Yeah. So I was glad that I finished when I did. I probably wouldn't have lasted much longer. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, that is so true. Yeah, is it almost because like I guess you tie a lot of like. I don't know, your self-worth into the work. And then when it doesn't go right, when there's like, even if it's like not in your control, yeah, yeah. like someone else, you know, screwed up yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to kill them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, yeah. so there's all of that. There's the idea that when some PhD projects, there's the idea you've got funding for a certain period of time. Yeah. After that, your funding runs out. Yeah. Just because the funding runs out doesn't mean that you can submit your PhD at that point. You still have work to do. Yeah. And when things are not working, you think, oh, heck, I just want to be free of this. And I'm, I know, and I'm getting to the point where I've just, I know, exhausted. I can't think clearly anymore. I can't get the work done, yeah. but I just need to before I can submit. Yeah. So I think that's what happens to every PhD student. And because it's, I think, how do I put it? I think the stereotype for a number of universities, undergraduate assignments is what a thousand words on this topic. And so they're very specific. This is what you need to do for it with a PhD because it's a lot more open-ended then it becomes really difficult to know, you know, you know, have I done enough? Is it good enough? Um, yeah, it'd be easier if it was, there's this very specific thing you need to achieve and I know whether I've achieved or not. PhD, because it's a lot more open-ended, that adds to yeah. the stress. Damn, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like even just deciding what you want to do yeah. <laughs> is stress. Yeah, so I do have some friends yeah. that are either currently doing a PhD or looking to do a PhD. So Please don't quit. <laughs> <laughs> wow, good one. But do you have any, I guess, tips for what you would, I guess, say to almost like a younger mask, per se? Hmm. I would say, chase the girls. <laughs> <laughs> wow! I would, yeah, so I would say, chase the girls. You don't, you don't spend all of your time sitting with a mass textbook and then wondering why the girls don't come to you. Um, but getting back, but getting back on, onto track. Um, I think sort of, yeah, I mean, I would sort of say, I think during my PhD, I, would have, I should have done more to get out and actually enjoy life. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's great doing a PhD. Yes, even though I've said a lot of negative things, yeah. there are challenges. It is good, though, for those people who are interested to have their PhD. At the same time, to make sure you've got a, an active life outside the PhD. Yeah. So you're going to try and have some sort of balance. And I think one of the things which I did, again, coming from that math stats IT perspective, um, the stereotype of being an introvert, which yeah. is for, for many of us, um, then the, I, the mistake I made, I would have loved to have gotten more, uh, gotten, gotten out more, spoken to a, lot, a larger number of people around different industry sectors, find out who they are, what are they doing, what are their advice for me in my career. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and what's really interesting is we'll see that later, Mark does a lot of education, a lot of talking <laughs> to people, so it's like a 360 flip, right? And then you very much become that person that people can go to you for advice, right? <laughs> that, that industry mentor that you've always wanted. <laughs> yeah, so flash forward, you finish your PhD, and then you're like, what now? I'm burnt out. <laughs> now you have to get a job, or yeah, what, what yeah, happens? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so I wanted to get it, finish the PhD and then just do something completely new. Um, just don't know. I, I, again, I said, spent, uh, while I was in the lab, so all of my friends from high school having these amazing lives and I thought, no, now it's my chance to have an amazing life. <laughs> so finished the PhD and then, then moved to Montreal. Oh. So I was in Montreal for three years. Wow, uh, and how, how do you choose Montreal out of everywhere? Oh, simply because the research lab that I was in had very strong ties with, with Montreal. Oh. So the research centre that I was in for the, for the PhD, this again they did the, the magnetic resonance spectroscopy. They also do magnetic resonance imaging. So moved into the medical imaging side and then went over to Montreal to sort of do that for three years. So Montreal is one of half a dozen labs around the, around the world, one of the top of the field when it comes to medical imaging. Oh, <laughs> damn. And then, wow, so what was the, so like, is it like when you've done your PhD, then you applied for the job, or was it during the PhD oh, you were yeah. thinking ahead and then? So it always becomes a little bit messy yeah. at the end of the PhD because you don't know exactly when it's going to be when it's going to be finished. Yeah. 
you also send off the PhD to your viewers, and it typically takes months, I mean, it can take six months or whatever for that to all be on it, to give their reviewers back, the reviewers feedback, to make those changes. So it's always a bit messy that you never quite finish the PhD before you start that next position. Yeah. So yes, so that was, that's what happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me, bear with me. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> Damn, you need to get water. <laughs> Yeah, do you know how long? Uh, we're, we're 35 minutes in. Oh, no, need a... oh, no, all good, all good. Okay, all good. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, so then you went to Montreal, and then what kind of work did you do? You said you tried to run as further away from, I guess, the sort of academic ish life? Oh, sorry. So, so I was working at, 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 at McGill University, so yeah. yes, oh, it was pursued an academic career, but I wanted to do, do, just do something else, do something different with my life. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so to go, sort of fly the opposite side of the planet um, <laughs> to, to be module for three years, that was, yeah. So, um, so work-wise, so the area that I was working was medical imaging. Oh. One of the things which you can do, and I'll try not to be too technical here, <laughs> but one of the things which you can do with medical images is a thing called functional magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging. So what you're doing with, again, functional magnetic resonance imaging, you're taking medical images, then you're getting a person to do a task. So like, for example, a motor task, getting people to tap their fingers together, and then you use the medical images again. You see the differences between the persons not doing the task when they're doing the task, and that's a sign of what part of the brain they're using to do that task. So you can do spatial map, you can do sort of uh, brain mapping throughout that. And so it's looking at statistical techniques of how to pull the data, the, the patterns out of that, of that sort of data. Ooh, that's <laughs> Yeah, and is this more, I guess, for intervention of some sort of diseases, or is it more kind of like just about like understanding more of the brain? Yeah, so it's more so it's more the model letter, so more trying to understand on it. So what part of the brain are you being used for different tasks? Yeah. Um, there is work to try to get it into the clinics. Um, it becomes challenging because the signal to noise ratio, um, signal to noise ratio, how much data, they, how much the, how much is their pattern, how much is their noise you're only just able to see the patterns because there's so much noise with it within such a data. Oh. oh, damn. So like almost sifting to find which what, the causality almost. Yeah, I mean, so the sense of the one of the applications where people would love to use a technique like that, if you do thing, if you've got patients, for example, who have, who have uh, brain tumors, yeah. you'd love to sort of say, okay, unfortunately we need, unfortunately you have a brain tumor, unfortunately we're gonna need to cut out the brain tumor. How do we make sure we make those cuts while not only cutting things which actually need in the brain. Oh. So then if you, if you were able to work out, well that part of the brain we need to make sure we don't touch that because that's used for honor, that's used for sight or that's used for language, yeah. but that other part of the brain, oh we can't, it doesn't like using that part of the brain much, so it's gonna be less problematic if we sort of try making cuts there. And so people would love to be able to use something like functional MRI to work out, well, how do we plan out the surgeries? Um, but again, it's, it's, rather, it's right now, that sort of, that idea of how do we move into the clinic, challenging again because of that signal to noise ratio. Yeah, damn, that's so hard <laughs> because if you have to like, it's like, what would, like what cut should I make that won't ruin your life? Yeah, 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 <laughs> and yeah. which cut that can I afford to try? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't really win if it's surgery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 so yeah. very challenging. And all I can say is, I'm glad I'm a PhD in mathematics, I'm glad I'm not a medical doctor because some of the decisions you have to make as a medical doctor, yeah, I, I, I would, I would find it very, dip, yeah, I'd, I'd find it really challenging. So, yes, medical doctors, <laughs> I encourage you. <laughs> I take my hat off to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I really need to get your hat off to this. <laughs> yeah, wow. And so was it like almost by chance that you sort of fell into the sort of medical kind of field um, because of Montreal? <clears throat> I mean, it was always this thing of that I wanted to do something I wanted to do something which was going to help people. Yeah. I mean, that's just, I don't know, that's just simply the, the thing which drives me. Yeah. So the first thing which you hear about is medicine. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's kind of funny because you know how you did engineering and then now you did medicine and now you're like, you're like, the, the, like you're having competition with yourself, right? Because you're doing the two most hardest. Wow. Yeah. 
But yeah, but that's kind of like really cool that early on that you like had that desire to help people because I feel like some people like maybe once they've like made something of themselves, once they were almost like self-satisfied their needs, then they start mm -hmm. to think about people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really incredible that mm. you, you know, considered it early on. And so you did Montreal for three years and yep. then what happened? So Montreal for three years. Um, and then after that, so that was the end of that placement. Then I sort of thought, okay, where, where, where haven't I gone to? So then thought, okay, can I join the pharmaceutical industry over in Europe? Both the pharmaceutical industry in the sense of, can I see what the industry side looks like now that I've tried the academia? Yeah. And also, can I go to Europe and just see what Europe looks like? Yeah. So to go to, to spend three years in Montreal where every weekend was either hiking or skiing, oh. to go to Switzerland where every, every weekend I was either, either hiking or skiing. Um, so, yeah, so it's so a lot that was supposed to be there for, for, a, lot, for a much bigger, um, much longer position. I only ended up there for six months uh, before, that before that position came to a close and came back to show. Oh, <laughs> wow. But that's so cool that you got to live that fun life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, damn, Mark, looks like he's having a time with his life. Even I didn't party that hard. <laughs> oh, damn. Were you almost like a little bit bummed to come back to Brisbane? Yeah, I mean, so I, I mean, so, so to be honest, I mean, it was one of these bizarre things. I mean, both the people, I mean, the people over in Montreal, well, at that stage, people both in Montreal and people in Brisbane complained about the way I spoke. Because when I was in Montreal, I would tell them, because they talk about how wonderful Brisbane was, yeah. and then when I came back to Brisbane, I'd tell them everybody about how wonderful Montreal was. <laughs> so I was, and, and that's probably the same with anybody who lives that sort of limbo sort of lifestyle. Yeah. There's always going to be things about either side that, that look fantastic. Yeah, damn, it just depends where you are right now, because yep. you always want what you can't have right exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> ah, uh, human nature. Yeah, so you came to Brisbane, and what kind of work did you do in Brisbane? Yep, yep. So you came back to Brisbane, um, went to work for the School of Mathematics at, at the, the Queensland University of Technology. So I was there for a couple of years, and then came to the School of Public Health um, here, at, here at the University of Queensland. Oh, and how did you decide, like, because you got a little bit of industry experience, how did you decide you still want to go with down the academia route? Yeah, I mean, it's in the sense of that I just hadn't spent enough time at an industry to really sort of be able to make a move. Yeah, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so almost like choosing like the safer option per yeah, se? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and what was your experience? Like, it seems like you've been to a lot of different universities. Yeah, yeah. Are there any sort of like, is like the difference just the people or like the content more or less is the same? Yeah, I mean, so I think that the, <clears throat> I think that as a researcher, when you go to some of these big universities, I mean, and again, Montreal is a big university. I mean, again, it's one of half a dozen, dozen, half a dozen labs, one at the top of the field. There's a lot of people there. And so that means that there's both a lot of people that are working there, but also because they're so large, there are a lot of people coming through. Fantastic, I'm in a small university. I'll go for an academic visit to Montreal. Mm -hmm. So you always have a lot of guest people coming for a well, short time. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's just a couple of days. Um, so you're either in that position where you want to be somewhere where there's a lot going on. And that's really good, particularly people starting in their, their academic career to be where the place where there's a lot going on. And, but at the same time, there's a lot of expectations, a lot of high expectations of staff at those sort of universities. To being at a small university where it's a bit more relaxed. I mean, they're, yes, there's still sort of things you need to achieve, but a bit more relaxed. But then instead of saying, well, I'm a small university, I want to collaborate with people at the large universities, so I'll now be the person who's going to visit those big universities. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of interesting, coming like from a big university. It's like, almost you're carrying like the brand on your yeah, shoulders, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Makes it extra heavy. Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. Wait, and then, so, whoa, you worked at QUT, and then yeah. you also worked at UQ, yeah, and yeah. then you decided public health sciences. And I guess that yeah, just yeah. pretty much aligns with your vision Yep, 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 yep. I mean, it was one of these things of that working in medical imaging, I mean, I absolutely loved the field, yeah. but it was a very, very specific field, yeah. which meant that, yes, you know, it'd be great to be in Brisbane doing this, and there might be like one job in Brisbane doing this. <laughs> so, I know you either have that job or you don't have that job, so it meant that it was, you know, how do you think about, career, about your future career if it's so limited? So I sort of said, well, actually, I need to move to another field. And the closest from medical image analysis using maths and IT to understand yeah. medical images is, um, is health statistics. So, you, you, so that's the move that which I was making. Oh, and what is health statistics? Okay, so, I mean, so the world that we're living in today, unfortunately, all of us are probably seeing health statistics on a daily basis. 
every time you're turning on the news, you're seeing things like the case numbers of COVID. Yeah. So what's happening in that, in, that, in that population, for example, wherever you are, population of Brisbane or Australia or wherever you are, what's happening to the cases? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? I don't know, vaccinations, is it good? Is it not? What are the side effects? What do the numbers say? So looking at those, that sort of health data, but in a number of different conditions. So, that, so that's health stats. <laughs> yeah, and also very complicated. <laughs> yeah, wow. So were you primarily, like, at UQ, were you primarily just, like, doing research or were you also teaching the No, no. Stats? So that was the thing which is bizarre. So I, over the, my entire academic career, I, I didn't even give a single university lecture um, oh. for my entire year. So did all that without giving a lecture and then left all of that to work primarily as a trainer in this area. Oh. <laughs> Wow, I'm so surprised. Yeah, because everyone, like, a lot of people, like, PhD is, like, they want to be a lecturer. Yeah, so, yeah. So, but, yeah, it seems like you went, like, really down the research route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which is really bizarre because most positions, most academic positions, they really want you to do a lot of teaching. Yes. Whether you want to or not. Yeah. The position which I was in, I was never asked to, uh, yeah. Yeah, wow. Okay, cool. And then, so, how long did you work in UQ Health Sciences? Yeah, for two years. Two years. Oh, okay. And then what happened next? <laughs> okay, so, I mean, and it was one of these bizarre things of that I knew going into that position, I knew that was going to be my last academic position. I wanted to be a stats consultant after that. Ah. So, which is really strange because most of the time you're in an academic position, you want yeah. to move into another academic position. Yeah. Um, so, it was, what do I do next? At the end of that position, I thought, okay, between, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm going to spend a week, probably a, I don't know, a week or maybe a month doing a couple of workshops around the place and then yeah, moving on my next position. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> and, and, and then a week, literally a week before, I, before the position ended, I decided, well, actually, I don't want to do that for a week or for a month. I want to do that full time. Yeah. So I left academia, well, for the most part, I left it completely. Yeah. Um, and I'm now actually the most active presenter of short courses in statistics in Australia. <laughs> so to put this in perspective, I've now presented something like 100 two-day workshops as well as 45-day workshops to academics all across Australia. Um, and it sort of this, one of the things which happened recently to sort of put this in perspective is that I was, uh, was applying to do training with a new organisation, through a new organisation, and they asked their trainers to classify themselves as having done previously <laughs> a small or a medium a lot of training. And for them, a lot of training was 10 workshops. And I thought, well, actually, I've done 140 workshops. Yeah. So, um, so, yes, so do that. As well as teaching, went over to Fiji three times to teach stats. Oh. And probably the last country that you'd think of where somebody would go over to teach stats, went over to North Korea to teach stats. Oh, <laughs> okay, we're going to dig into that uh, a bit and later. Any, any government people, I didn't go to North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, damn, that's kind of crazy because why didn't someone give Mark a teaching <laughs> position early on, right? You had to sort of like forge your way. But I find that it's so interesting that like, um, because you know a lot of people, when they've done academia for so long, they feel like um, there's like a really high switching cost for them to try something new. So was mm -hmm. there a lot of concern for you like, oh my gosh, I'm going to start from zero again if you were to, no? No, no, no. I mean, and, and I think that's one of the challenges which I've, which I've had within my organisation is I'm aware that a lot of organisations, you start from, on it, you start and you build it up. Yeah. Whereas I was aware that I came into my organisation and the thing which I started off with was presenting workshops. I mean, and to put this in perspective, I mean, when I come into these workshops, half the people are typically on it, PhD students. The other half are sort of academic staff, so academics all the way up to heads of school who are coming in and learning the stats from me. Um, so, so that's where I'm starting and that's challenging because how do I grow a business from there? So we're currently in the process of setting, of, well, I'm not building the, the foundation below me to then sort of say, so we're in the process right now start of going, be, where we'll be able to work under another, under another organisation called the Registered Training Organisation. Mm -hmm. So a little bit like a university but at a much, much smaller level. Yeah. Um, they might have 10 staff rather than thousands of staff. And so working towards over the coming year, by the end of next year, we'll be able to teach 45 qualifications all the way from certificate one to graduate diploma level within my company. So that way we've got that on the early stages, knowing that what I train myself is much higher level than that. But at least there's a way for people then, a natural progression for people to join my business and grow within the business. Oh, damn. So you're saying that because 
when you first started, you taught like all the top executives. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, what about like everyone who got left behind? <laughs> so you're sort of like building like um, course, like level one, yeah. sort of bridge the way up to yeah, your course, yeah, yeah, like yeah, 10, yeah. 20. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's actually really unusual. Yeah, yeah. But I'm also quite interested in like, how do you go from like having an idea, a hobby, and then into actually like building it into a business? And Ooh, yeah. good question. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think that the, I think for me, the, the example that I always think about, um, even though I'm, even though I'm like, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I mean, this whole idea that the one thing which I'm good at, which is mathematics, is, is in such high demand. I mean, if I was good at one thing and it was you know, twiddling my thumbs, yeah. then I mean, I might be really great at twiddling my thumbs. Nobody's going to employ me or pay me yeah. any money to twiddle my thumbs. So how on earth could I make any money out of that? Yeah. The people which I admire, uh, people who are in the art profession, but I sort of say things like, fantastic, I, don't know, I might go work for a marketing company, I might love doing on it, paintings, and that's what I do in my hobby, but I might need to do graphic art and make on it, advertising, to, on it, advertising which might go on TV, I'm still using somewhat of what yeah. drives me, but also for that purpose where the, there are people willing to pay for that purpose, yeah. how do I combine that with, on it? so during my work hours I do similar to what I love, and then outside my work, I can really do the things I love. Now, imagine that, imagine the movie industry is the same people as to say, yes, I have to make movies the way that the public like them, and I hate the movies I'm making sometimes, but I know that there's a market for this, so I'll make the movies that way, and then I make my, make my, in, my indie movies on the side, knowing yeah. that's not going to have the public appeal, but it's the movies the way that I want to make them. Yeah, but that's so cool that it's like it's still revolving around the passion. It's just like almost like a different, like I guess a side of the coin, a different yeah. angle. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that's pretty cool that like yeah, maths has been like <laughs> a common thread throughout your whole story. Right, tell it to your grandpa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So whoa, where were we at? We were. Um, you started your company. Yeah. So was it? Um, you said like. You just like, how many workshops did you run and then you're like, oh, actually, I really want to do this full time. Was it like... Oh, so, so, so one week before I left academia, yeah. I decided that I was going to do it full time. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Damn. And did you, you already, um, you already sort of like, I don't know, put in your resignation letter and then... Yeah, I mean, so in the sense of the, the funding, I mean, all the way from the start, there would only be like a two year position. Oh, yeah. So, the, um, yeah, so came to an end. I mean, I had advertised, hmm, hmm. apologies to people in Toowoomba as I say this, I knew that, I knew that the first workshops, the very first workshop which I do, would be a disaster. Only, I mean, I knew that because I had never taught a workshop before, yeah. and there's no way to know what works and what doesn't work until you're actually there presenting a workshop. So I decided, I'm going to go to Toowoomba, which is a couple of hours outside Brisbane. I'm going to go to Toowoomba, present these workshops, that way, if they're complete disasters, no, I know that I'm never going to go back to Toowoomba to teach any more workshops, though, if, it, if they were a disaster. Oh, <laughs> so I went up there. So Thankfully, they weren't a disaster. Massive yeah. sigh of relief. Um, but there were things that are there that I would do differently. Yeah. But yes, I've built from there. Yes. Yeah, but that is so smart, man. Like, what's st what happened in Toowoomba <laughs> stays in Toowoomba. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, shout out to all the Toowoomba folks. You were, you were, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Mark's first <laughs> workshop. Wow. Wait, and so, like, how do you sort of, like, um, was it sort of easy to, like, advertise, like, hi, guys, you know, I'm Mark, I'm running a workshop, you know. Yeah. I mean, you definitely have all the qualifications. Yeah. Uh, but you haven't taught before, and how do you sort of go about promoting? Did you, who did you target? How do you find yeah. people to go to the, your workshop? <laughs> so the strategy which I used was that I just, uh, wherever I went, I mean, oh, let's go back a step. For me, I love training, and the, I love training both in the sense that I enjoy it, but it also makes a lot of sense business-wise. Yeah. So training, you can decide when I want to present a workshop, where I want to present a workshop, what I'm going to present. So long as you get the numbers in, you can decide exactly what you want to do. You don't need to, so I would hire, each time I ran a workshop, I'd hire a room at a, at a local university. I'd advertise around that university to say, I'm teaching this workshop, and then we'd just get individual registrations into those workshops. Oh, <laughs> actually, that's really cool that you yeah. used, like, the university as the base, right? Because you yeah. have really good connections, so yeah, you're, yeah, like, yeah. reputable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And I guess, 
Did you sort of, I guess, charge in the beginning? Or yeah. like, how did you... Yep, 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 yep. yep. So you, you say even... Yes, uh, apologies to him, but please don't ask for, ask for the money back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so, yes, so always charged. I mean, yeah. I mean, I have to admit that I don't charge anywhere near what industry pays. So, yeah. um, so uh, how do I put this in perspective? So, I mean, and keep in mind that, the, that this is undercharging. So, um, I, I tend to set lower rates than other people. Um, I would, for a two-day workshop, so it started, it started out I just presented two-day workshops, um, $500 per person for two-day workshop, which meant that if you had a full class of 20 people, that's ten thousand dollars for two-day workshop. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and what does industry generally charge? Oh, I mean, if you went to industry, I mean, the, and you, I mean, you, I mean we're talking about, I don't know, people wearing, I don't know, the presenter wearing a, a business suit, who is attending wearing a business suit. I um, mean, you could easily charge, you could easily charge twice then. Oh, <laughs> wow, damn! And I guess, how did you know that, like, you were gonna like? Um, how much, how much, like, so take me back to that first workshop. How did you know that you would, like, how many people did you need for you, for it to be, like, I guess, quotes worthwhile? Oh, I mean, so in the sense that I, that I didn't get the numbers that, I mean, I mean, it was only just, only just half a dozen people in each workshop. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's all I needed at that beginning. Oh. I mean, in the sense of that I wasn't primarily there to make, I wasn't primarily there to make money in that very first workshop. I was just primarily there to sort of say, is this going to work? Is it not going to work? what can I learn about it? Yeah. Um, and by the, by the time I actually, between when I finished that academic position to when I presented the workshop, yeah. I actually organ, or, or, organised a number of, uh, number of workshops elsewhere across Australia. Oh. Um, so, that, and they actually brought a lot more people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And was it sort of like, um, I guess, did you have to pay the university for renting the room or yes, how did yes, it work? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. So I guess they were more than happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sort of, oh, wow. And then advertising, was it just like, you know, there's definitely a lot of advertising behind toilet doors. How oh, did yeah. you advertise? <laughs> yeah. How did you advertise? I mean, so, so in the sense of the, just on academics that I knew around the place, um, emailed them, asked them to forward on the, the emails. That's what I did. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. And then... How was it like presenting the first workshop? Because you said you haven't really taught before. So yep, yep. That did you was have a lot of imposter syndrome or <laughs> so a lot of imposter syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm, that's an interesting question. <clears throat> I think my style is that I tend to be, I don't know, so it's so like it, so love it or hate it. I tend to be honest with my, I tend to be honest and I sort of say, this is what I know, this is actually what I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I'm quite honest. I try to be really honest with this, what I don't know. Um, I think the only time that I sort of struggle with I don't know, something like an imposter syndrome is, and it's always surprising when this happens, you go into a workshop and, I, and you think, you walk in, you think all the people know about you is just what they see on a piece of paper, and already there are people who just put enormous faith in you, and you think, yeah. all you know, you know right now is I'm, is I'm just about to present a workshop, all you know about me is a p on a, my name on a piece of paper, you haven't yet heard anything which I've said because the workshop hasn't started yet, yeah. but you're already treating me like I'm such an impressive person. Yeah. Surely, if I was in your position, I'd wait, I'd hear what the guy has to say before I decide whether or not I'm going to sort of trust this person or not. So, some, so most people are like that, but there are some people who sort of say, no, moment I arrive, Mark, you're an absolute guru, and think, wait, hang on, listen to what I say, and then decide whether you, whether you, whether you think that. Ah, oh, damn, that is so interesting. And does that, I guess... Um, does that give you like a bit of additional pressure? Is that are you worried more about like the dropping of expectations or oh. or do you like oh like I mean it should be sort of cool in a way like oh wow like I'm not going to really have people challenging what I'm going to say. People are going to be like yeah Mark you're God, <laughs> <laughs> Mark you're the guru whatever whatever floats your boat whatever Mark says yeah so or is it are you like how come that would bother you? Is it that you're worried that like. Um, that like you've almost won their trust too easy or you're worried yeah. that it's going to drop? Yeah, I mean, so there's a sense, I mean, I'm the sort of person who, if people, you know, I don't want to let people down. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, just, just, I mean just, my, just my personality. Yeah. So if somebody puts their faith in me, I want to make sure that, that I own that. Yeah, okay, cool. Then I guess we're pretty much on the same page <laughs> because 
<laughs> me too, right? Like, um, I feel so comfortable when people, they have no expectations yeah, of me. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, I, I just tell them, like, I'm like, yeah, I'm just like, you know, da 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 I don't really know anything, and then I feel yeah. great. And then yeah. when the expectations bump up, I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> but if it starts from the top, I feel like, wow, if it's too high, it can only go down. Yep, 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 so, yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Same, same reasons. <laughs> yeah, and then I guess, like, how do, um, so you went from, I guess, um, you went from like one workshop and then Toowoomba and then did you immediately, you planned out mm -hmm. every single workshop after? I mean, so, so in week. the sense of, <clears throat> so what I would always do, start advertising three months prior to a workshop. Mm. And it's always surprising when you, are, you send advertising out, within a week later you can start to get thousands of dollars starting to come in, <gasps> even though that's well in advance. Um, I mean, so you need to be really careful with that because if you suddenly need to cancel it, which I've only had to do once or twice, uh, just just because of, in those cases we only had a couple of people registering, so you need to make sure you don't spend the money because otherwise <laughs> you need possibly might need to get the money back. Um, <laughs> but yes, so that's always surprising. But um, yeah, so you advertise three months in advance, but that meant that I knew, I didn't have to really plan things out. I can just say, oh look, I think it's time for me to give some more workshops. I'll start advertising now. I don't know I've, I don't know, I haven't been to Perth for a while, so I'll go to Perth. So. Um, yeah. Oh, damn. And did you hold all your workshops at universities? Yeah, yeah, sure, for sure. Oh, <laughs> so I guess who, like, like, what kind of people went to your workshops? Were they like primarily students or? So probably about half, half students, primarily PhD students and half academic staff. Oh, cool. And I'm also kind of curious, like, I guess like university, I would almost see them as your competitor in some ways, right? Because they are ready, they already have their stats course, right? And they're like... Oh, sorry, no, no, no. Sorry. So the people which I train are not people in stats. So I've only, only once or twice have I had somebody in stats come into my <laughs> workshops. So these are people... Yeah. And again, this whole idea that everybody's collecting data, wanting to make sense of the patterns present within the data. Yeah. So all academics, I mean, but it's always this thing of I'm doing research, just because I know about know, medicine or whatever, yeah. doesn't necessarily mean I've got the research skills to be able to do research on medicine. Yeah. Or it's, I know, oh yes, I'm, I'm assumed to know stats, but I've actually never learned stats. Some, that's what some academics will say. So where do I get that stats training from? So they need to sort of come along to the workshops like this in order to build that, that up. Mm, that's true, yeah, because I guess there is no sort of clash because Yours is a very, I guess, it's like a two day. It's very short. <laughs> no one's gonna like take an elective. It's gonna take one semester. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, oh, that's pretty cool. And has it been, um, are people like, I guess you sort of um, segregate by like, um, like their level, different levels, or how does it work? Yep, so I mean, so every workshop, I'll sort of phrase, what is the, what is the background re required to yeah. come into the workshop? But I mean, I'll teach anywhere from, what I call gentle, gentle introduction to stats. Yeah. And, when I, and I didn't just call it introduction to stats, I call it gentle introduction. Because yeah. I'm aware that people are just saying, oh, I know I want to learn stats, but I haven't done any stats before, and I'm actually really scared about actually going and actually learning anything about stats. Yeah. So I sort of phrase it as gentle introduction. And I, and I say to them, look, there's only one question you're not allowed to ask in this workshop. And that question is, am I allowed to ask the question? Because <laughs> the answer is yes. I don't care if you get to the end of a workshop and you say, what is stats, what is a number, what is data? Yeah. I'd rather answer the question than you go away not knowing the answer. So, yes, yeah, so I got a gentle introduction and I should just say, no, no, prior, back, no prior knowledge required. On it. You, you're a bit apprehensive of stats, this is the workshop for you. Yeah. All the way through to the, to the most, um, probably the most advanced stuff which I do. So there's a natural progression of, and, and you'll just see this in the courses, don't it? Basically, I don't know, stats, I mean, equivalent to what you might learn in the first week in Stats 101, yeah. Stats 101 here at university, then an introduction to stats, then a more advanced method called regression, then more advanced methods, which I don't think you see within the course, which is um, things, things like the, 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 lo the long jewel analysis, so things like your mixed effects models, which are like regression, but more advanced still. Yeah. So mathematics, there's this natural, it's a challenging field to teach because in things like medicine, I mean, you can just say, look, I'm teaching on this topic, but I'm not requiring a lot of background knowledge. Mathematics is a very linear thing. If I don't understand a basic concept, I can't move on to more advanced concepts until I understand the most basic concept. Oh, There's a natural true. progression. Um, so yes, so in every workshop, here's what you need to know. Ah, oh, that's pretty cool. So would you say there's like around roughly like four levels? I mean, so, so in the sense of the, the way that I teach it, Yeah. Um, the, the, the workshops which I teach, then there are like three levels. Yeah. Um, but yeah. 
a bit yeah. of brain, but in general, they, there's a spectrum. Yeah, that's cool. And so I guess, like, how do you, um, yeah, how, like, so you've, um, when you do, like, a workshop, how do you sort of plan when you want to do your next workshop? Do you have, like, a, like, I don't know, like, a goal of how many workshops you want to hit, or is it kind of... No, no, no. So I do another workshop. I think, okay, getting a bit quiet. Um, getting a bit quiet might be benefit a bit from a bit more money, so yeah. I'll go and do some more workshops. <laughs> But you can't, uh, I guess you can't do it so spontaneously because you, you sort of advertise three months in a half. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So yeah, sure. are you like, ah, oh, I'm thinking that probably in two or, two or so months I'm going to run yeah. out of cash? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, wait, so like, what's <coughs> Oh, yeah, you need water seed. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> So, um, like, generally, like, now, how regular do you teach your workshops? Is it like... Um, so I present, oh, good question. And to be honest, it's going to become more complex because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so part of COVID, um, so part of the start of 2020, yeah. for the last 10 years, I mean, I'm one of these people who, for the last 10 years, I would be either interstate or overseas, yeah. at least a quarter of the time. And it's one of these things, one of these bizarre things of that, um, hmm. so confession, I'm actually, actually a very nervous flyer. I mean, this whole idea that I, you're on a plane, you've got your feet on the metal, and then you've got 10 kilometres, like nothing, and there's the land. That freaks me out. Yeah. And yet for the last 10 years, on average, I've caught one flight every two weeks. Oh. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so um, but yes, so um, we do all that suddenly, like everybody, suddenly, everybody going online on it, this massive switch at the start of 2020. Um, so these days, what do I do? I present something like... So like six five-day workshops each year, maybe half a dozen two-day workshops each year. Um, and to be honest, when I first started the, the, train, the business, probably the first two years, I just I had no aspirations in being in it, being anything more than one-person business. Mm. I had no aspirations to, in doing consulting. I just wanted to do training. Whereas these days, I'll probably spend three quarters of my time doing training and one quarter consulting. Mm. Wow, damn, that's pretty cool. And do you ever get sick of like, I'd imagine like the material gets <laughs> gets a bit stale when you like keep teaching it, or do you yeah. sort of vary? Do you... so the material does get stale, and that's why it's good. I mean, I've got so I've got three staff members that work for me, yeah. and they all do an absolutely phenomenal job. And then I typically have maybe some like half dozen interns um, in, in each um, semester or trimester, and just the the, the idea of new people coming in and uh, who are working for me and seeing that material and giving me feedback about, Mark, I don't, maybe next time you teach this, maybe do it this way, yeah. then that adds a lot more I don't know, life into what I'm doing. Yeah, that's cool. And have you ever thought about, like, I don't know, getting someone else to do the teaching for you, or is oh, that... So that's, that's the problem. Because I'm training, training at that level, yeah. I would need to find somebody else at that level, uh, whereas that's the RTO, yeah. to get bring people in, and they teach from, all the way from certificate, from certificate one, and over time, yeah. they grow their, their, their teaching skills. But like you said, find someone that level. But if you're teaching like a level one gentle introduction, surely you could get like, I don't oh. know, a month. So would you, yeah. you, would, you would do outsource yeah, so, that? So, yeah, so I mean, so in the sense of that I could do that. But you don't. Yeah, well, yeah I haven't done that so far. <laughs> yeah, because I guess like the, the biggest kick would be like, kick out of it that you get would be the teaching, would it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, and, and I think quite, the, the, quite admittedly, the reason why I've been so successful in the business is because there are so few people they want to teach that. I mean, it's something which a lot of people need to know and a lot of people want to know, but the people who know have that, have that knowledge, most of them, as a stereotype, yeah. most of them are introverts. So yeah. I don't know, actively looking for, for, for training opportunities is not what they want to do. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's quite interesting. Yeah, and then I guess, how did you sort of um, branch out into consulting? <clears throat> so over the first few years, I just had enough people ask me and beg me, can, I, can, I, can you do some consulting for me? <laughs> and again, it's this whole idea that a lot of people, they just don't know anybody in the state. So when they go into trouble, yeah. they're going to trouble and they need help, there's nobody that they know to ask. Yeah. Um, just because there's so few, people, so, few people, so few people working in the states. Yeah. So after a few years, I thought, okay, I've had my arm twisted enough, I'm starting to give in. Yeah. And then when I started doing the consulting, then said, oh yeah, probably, I can probably can do the consulting. And then moved all the way up from when I first started. I mean, these were academics spending like one or two hours of my time. And then 
these days I'll probably do one or two big consulting projects a year. So right now, for example, I'm just about to finish a project for Good Start Early Learning. Mm -hmm. Good Start's a large provider of early learning within Australia. They got 649 sites, 13,000 staff, and 70,000 children currently attend Good Start. So currently having regular meetings with one of the executive board members of Good Start. And she's given me a data set of 60,000 children to analyse for them, mm -hmm. which is the largest analysis of their data to date. Yeah. So that's, I know, we do one or, two, one or two big consulting projects like that a year. Yeah, damn. So, and Mark, on top of that, <laughs> he also teaches, do you teach two courses or one courses at UQ? This year I taught three. Three? <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow. And are you doing like your sixth degree right now? And I'm doing, and I'm doing the sixth one. So, um, so, I've, yeah, so all of my, maths, my degrees so far in the math stats IT space, I'm doing a, a graduate certificate in professional learning right now. And I'm going to go on and do a Master's of Education after that. Oh, wow. So, um, <laughs> time management, Mark. Tell me about it. Um, <laughs> no sleep. Well, I work a lot. Yeah. I, also, huh, I also party a lot. Oh, <laughs> are you talking like party party, like clubbing? Or what are we um, talking? Almost. I mean, it's in the sense of... So, um, I... Hmm. So, don't tell me all, all the other students that this yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I do about... Something between six and eight hours of Latin dancing each week. Ooh, <laughs> spicy! <laughs> so I mean, and, and it's one of these. I mean, for myself, I mean, I love the the Latin, the Latin dance clubs because we are there to dance. I mean, you have an. Um, I mean, so no judgment, but you've got some clubs where you know people are there just to get drunk. Yeah. And sort of some people love that, some people hate that. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas something like myself, I mean, you, you go along to Latin dance clubs and people are there to dance. So yes, people drink a bit, yeah. but they don't want to drink too much because they want to really enjoy the dancing. So that's a fantastic environment. Um, so every Friday night, yes, yeah, so let, me, let me put a plug out. If you're on the Gold Coast, so I, live, I still live on the Gold Coast. If, um, if you're on the Gold Coast on a Friday night, Stingray's, Stingray Bar at the QT Hotel, I don't get paid for them, no commission, <laughs> but Latin Dance Club, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So do that. Saturdays, I'm an intern at a scuba diving school, so I teach scuba diving. Oh, <laughs> So, um, so almost every Saturday doing that, um, absolutely love that. So, yeah, so I party a lot, so work a lot, party a lot, don't sleep much. Oh, <laughs> damn, damn. And I have to ask, the Latin dancing, is it like partner dancing or yeah, is yeah. it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. spicy. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Um, I like how like you're doing like, I don't know, completely random things. Yeah. Like it's almost like at the opposite um, you know, like of the spectrum, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like dancing and mathematics, right? <laughs> yeah, wow. And I guess how do you sort of, um, how do you sort of like switch off from work kind of thing? Because, um, oh. yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, so the things which, I mean, those, sort of, those type of activities, so the things which I need to do because all of my work is up here yeah. or speaking or typing, yeah. I, need to, I need to be outside, I need to be with people. And I don't know, so being outside with people doing a physical activity, yeah. That's the sort of stuff which really helps me switch off. Or at least yeah. helps me use on a, a different part of the plane. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. And I guess like, yeah, how do you, like, have you considered like um, cutting back on the work or do you actually love it that much? I love it, I love it. I'm, I'm one of these people who's never going to retire <laughs> just because I love what I'm doing. Wow, but surely it must get like tiring. Like you feel, no, I you, you it. I pack love it. <laughs> your days to the brink. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yep, yep, and I'm constantly thinking, how can I squeeze more in? Wow, damn. <laughs> so, um, is, is burnout a thing, Mark? Um, I keep on complaining to other people about how tired I am. Yes. Um, but I love what I'm doing, so I don't I mean, I mean, th things like, for example, it's, it's that good start project. I mean, I don't know if many people that could sort of say, yes, I regularly get data sets of, data sets of 60,000 children or 60,000 people to analyse, yeah. and I don't regularly get to meet with people like that. So to sort of say, I, know, I, I give that up. It's a little bit like um, David Attenborough. So you, so you know David Attenborough. So um, he, he's now in his 70s. He still does all the TV presenting. Oh. And he's been asked constantly, I know, are you going to retire anytime soon? And he says, look, I travel to the most exciting parts of the world. I see all these amazing animals and I get paid to do this. Yeah. Why would I ever retire? Same thing for me. I love what I'm doing. Why would I ever want, want to retire? Damn. So, Mark, if you won the lottery tomorrow, you're still going to be living this life? <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I won the lottery tomorrow, then, 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 then there will a lot more mathematics textbooks to buy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Damn. 
I think I'm speechless. I think I don't think I've ever asked anyone who actually loves their work. Yeah, I love what I'm doing. I absolutely love it. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's one of the things, I mean, I think there's a lot of people who have a small business and struggle to keep afloat. Yeah. Whereas I think that the, because of the one thing which I'm good at is there's such, in high, such high demand. Yeah. I mean, I constantly being, being I know, swamped with people asking for help. Um, so there's no shortage of work. And it's, I, know, I love what I'm doing. There's no shortage of work. Yeah. yeah. And what, what is it that you love? Is it like the new insights or is it... Oh, it's the it's the puzzles, it's the challenges, it's the people, it's the projects. I mean, it's the projects. So, good starts exciting. Probably the most exciting stuff which I've done for me personally yeah. is working. Um, so, my biggest passion is working in the international development sector. Yeah. So, I did a project a few years ago where we were looking at twenty thousand people over in um, Southeast Asia on the topic of human trafficking. Yeah. And thinking, how do I use mathematics, but use mathematics and make such a sort of amazing sort of um, amazing um, contribution to what's happening in the world. I think yeah. those sort of opportunities you don't get very often. If you can do them, why would you ever want to pass them up? Yeah, damn. Yeah, and I also have to ask you, so you also teach here three courses yep. at the university and I guess like how, like I obviously know they're quite different to running like two day workshop, five day yeah, workshops, yeah. but like how do you sort of like, um, how do you find the two different? Hmm. I think the biggest challenge which I have, the biggest challenge, I mean, so quite admittedly, the biggest challenge which I have is that I'm so used to training people who have known what they have been way out of the workforce for many years, yeah. and I'm teaching undergraduates and sort of saying, and, and, and I have to admit that I always sort of say things like, well, you know how in the workforce this will happen, <laughs> and I just get this blank looks on people's faces, yeah. and I think, yes, of course they're not going to understand what I'm saying because <laughs> they haven't yet experienced this. Or I'm going to say, look, this is a really important technique, as you all know, you're doing this all the time. We've never done this before. And I think, yeah. oh, heck, no, they haven't. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges of how do you teach people who haven't yet, who, who either haven't seen or just starting to see this in the workforce. And that's the challenge, whereas I'm so used to teaching workshops and I sort of say, here's your technique, and people might sort of say, oh, that's challenging. I can see, where, I can see why I really need it, but I'm challenged by it. But people who sort of say, look, I don't see why this is relevant. And I'm thinking, oh heck, no, of course you wouldn't because you haven't gotten in the yeah. workforce yet. Oh, damn, that's so crazy. You have to <laughs> yeah. sort of, you have to imagine Mark and strip away X knowledge, <laughs> X, Y knowledge, and you're like, how do I make sense of this? Yep. Yeah, and how did you decide that, like, obviously, like, Len approached you and, like, yep. hey, yep. I'm doing business analytics, but, yep. like, what, I guess, made you decide that you wanted to do it? Because you are already doing a heck load of teaching, <laughs> and I feel like, I don't know, like, of course, you have, like, another title to your CV, <laughs> but, like, what does it add? Because <laughs> um, you're already doing this stuff anyways. So I think everybody has their weaknesses. Yeah. My weakness is that if I see something which I want to do, then the answer is yes. Do you have time for it? Then I haven't considered it. But you, do you want to do it? Yep, I'll do that as well. Uh, and if I just keep on adding things, I don't realise that actually, maybe that's not a good thing to do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like temptation. Hundreds. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And we're wrapping it up towards yeah. the end, so just yeah. a few more questions. Yeah. So just going to throw out one in the open. Mark, what do you think the meaning of life is? <laughs> oh, I'm not. Yes. So we have 13 minutes before it's 2 p.m. So. <laughs> what do I think is the meaning of life? I mean, I think simply. I mean, well, a meaning of life. I won't phrase it as the meaning of life. A meaning of life. Find what. Find what you enjoy, what you're passionate about. Find the way that you can, con 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 you can contribute to making the world a better place. I mean, I don't care if the, the thing which you do is you're, not, you're good at smiling at other people, <laughs> or not, you're good at the person, being the person who you know, picks up the litter behind somebody else or whatever. Whatever you find is a thing which you're passionate about, where you can make a contribution. Find those things, find the things that make you happy. That's for me is a meaning of life. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Happiness. <laughs> yeah, and the second question is, I'm also, you know, a bunch of the students that you're teaching, they're yeah. graduating yeah. this year, including yeah. me, yeah. just one more month. What, yeah. what kind of advice do you sort of have and Ooh. rules for be, life? So all I can say is be ready for the journey ahead. I think that, I think that one of the things which is a misconception, you feel as an undergrad yeah. that, oh, no, oh, heck, I have to do so much work because I'm an undergrad at university. Yeah. And yes. Just get, wait, just get ready for next year because you're going you're to look back and you think, 
I was a university student once, I had so much time and I was, this life was so easy and now I've got so much more work to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, that, but then again, I mean, I'm excited about, about your cohort. I mean, the yeah. things, the places where you guys are going to be and the projects which you're going to be working on, you're going to be sort of, I mean, this whole idea that I consider myself fortunate in that I've been teaching and sort of consider, say, these people that I taught, they're now in this amazing place in this world, amazing projects, making such a contribution. I'm just on it. I'm just um, um, honoured by them. Aww, that's yeah. so beautiful. <laughs> and we have to like end the note on yeah. a funny one. Yeah. Can we hear any of that singing? If you're up for it, if you're up for it. <laughs> okay, well, anyways, you guys have to comment on the comments below and maybe we can invite them <laughs> for maybe a little bit of Latin dancing and singing. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're pretty much done here. Um, oh, I have to ask you, what was your podcast experience like? Because it must have been oh, so good. random. I was like, hey, Mark, <laughs> come on my podcast. <laughs> That's good. Very good. Always do it. Please switch out, one. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Good place to end this. Shall we say bye? <laughs> bye.